According to the latest figures from the ITU, 97% of the world population now lives within reach of a mobile cellular signal, although that drops to about 93% for 3G or 4G. Pretty impressive. There are significant geographical differences, though. 3G coverage in Africa falls to 79%, for example. But this doesn't correlate with online access. 46% of the global population, some 3.6 billion people, are still without internet access. So there's plenty of room for improvement. But how? Joining me to discuss new innovations in the radio access network, which will play a major role in connecting the remaining unconnected, are from Boston, USA, Mark Longwell, who is director of the OpenStack Partner Ecosystem at Red Hat, and from Shannon Island, Daniel Lynch, segment marketing director at Intel. Welcome to Telecom TV, the two of you. Thanks for having Thank us. Thanks for joining us on, on this uh, discussion. It's a very important discussion as well. Um, it's a very important subject and very important that we, we do our utmost to revitalize the RAN segment to, to try and connect the, the unconnected. Um, Mark, if I can start with yourself. We've got the headline figures there from the ITU. Um, so let's first identify the problem. W what is the state of connectivity globally and how does Red Hat see things? Yeah, as you stated, you know, the majority of the unconnected populations are in regions like Africa. Um, and that these are the areas that are also characterized by, you know, the low economic ability to pay for services or a willingness, right? So the ARPU, from a service provider perspective, uh, is probably lower than in densely populated, you know, tier one countries, let's say. So that puts some downward pressure on the service providers, you know, around cost and building out infrastructure and so forth. So it's, you know, we're relying on new technologies, more cost-effective technologies, is a way that these underconnected areas will be serviced in the future. And Daniel, from Intel's perspective, um, what's the state of connectivity globally? Um, when we talk about the uh, unconnected um, uh, market, I, th I think we all need to be a little bit mindful of the, the privileged position we are you know, working on in multinational companies, a very profitable companies, and, and then we're talking about uh, you know areas where uh, water access, food access, you know. It, it, so we, we need to be very aware of that. So, so the way I look at this is more, and they can answer your question about the, the business problem. I, I kind of try to, um, to to use a personal example. Prior to joining Intel, um, I, I worked with a company that provided uh, rural broadband service, and and as a really, really small company, four or five people. Uh, we're going to town hall meetings to meet these uh, um, rural communities and, and talk about the problems that they have. And this, it, this is more of an Irish perspective, but you know, whether it be America, Africa, China, every geo, every country has its own story and its own issue. And you get the same kind of feeling, you know, the feedback, yeah, no connectivity equals to um, opportunity starvation, right? It's, it's just really, uh, kids aren't able to learn, business aren't able to thrive. And then also, the, you know, really what at the heart of it is, is that it's not the ARPU, it's more, you know, we were there as a small, nimble company looking to provide service, but the city so established tier one providers and the supply chain, they're in the same town hall meeting, listen to the same people, but their problem is, is their whole portfolio is designed around a dense urban, a city environment, providing whether it be wireline or broadband connectivity, and all business models based on that. And then the salesperson is in that room scratching their head, going, uh, "How do I, how do I sell this service? How, how do I apply the infrastructure on on this costly equipment?" Whereas we, the smaller company, very agile. Uh, we're going, wow, this is, this is perfect, this is a great market for us. So I think the business problem worldwide is, is that lack of openness, the, uh, enable, the enabling of a, 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 a disruption in the supply chain to provide the smaller players entry into the market where those markets are, are perfectly uh, viable for that, the smaller players. So I think that that's at the heart of the the, the, the big challenge for f facing the market. And I think the likes of you know, going hardware software abstraction, um, uh, tip open ran what's happening in the ORAN community will open up that market for those new entrants to be able to connect those un unconnected businesses wh wherever they may be across the world. Um, Mark, why can't our legacy approaches fulfill this demand to connect these communities? What, what's wrong with the current model? Our legacy 
I would say our legacy services could, but they're really built out for densely populated markets. One of the good things about the unconnected areas is we really have a, a green field opportunity, right? There's no legacy to deal with. So we can bring in technologies that fit the cost model, fit the, you know, the scale models in those unconnected markets. It may not be 5G right off the bat, but it could be something that is, is lower, but has a cost and economic model that is, you know, I would say, appropriate for that region. Daniel, you've already talked about um, the fact that a lot of today's RANs are designed around more denser rollouts and, and deployments. So let's look at what the alternatives are. Let's look at some of these new RAN models and, and architectures. We're, we're hearing a lot about the open model um, currently, um, where we leverage virtualization and, and disaggregation to, to extend the supplier ecosystem and, and increase the options for CSPs. How is this, how is this faring so far? I think it's... It <laughs> When you look at the RAN, it's a much slower um, market than the rest of the network. It takes time. Um, so first and foremost, what, what the investments across the board from all major players, to be fair, the tier ones and the service providers, they're heavily involved in whether it be TIP Open RAN um, or O-RAN, they're investing in the APIs and the um, you know, hardware software abstraction, but it just takes time. And um, what what that allows um, new players in the market to do is is to have a, a more vibrant ecosystem, where you have uh, some companies who want to specialize in Radiohead, just in Radiohead, others on uh, digital units, others as software, soft IP, system integrators, all come together and be a specialized um, player in, in for that part of the market, and then enable those brand you know a, a broader. A deployment of the RAN for areas where, where traditionally it didn't make economic business sense for the, the classical traditional way of doing of, of, of rolling out the network. And Mark, how is Red Hat supporting this alternative open-based RAN model? Yeah, I would I would echo Daniel's comments in regards to the ecosystem that's vital for Red Hat, right? So, for example, working with companies like Altio Star and Intel on reference architectures in the RAN space that could be leveraged in these unconnected areas and obviously in the newer 5G areas uh, is key to Red Hat's success. For us, it's all about the ecosystem. It's all about the open source model and working with partners like Intel and Altio Star is just one example of how we're looking to support the move to 5G into RAN in the, in the global marketplace. Daniel, is it a choice between the RAN as we see it today and an open run model, whatever that open run model is, or, or what about some of these alternative ideas that, that have been floated around and, and, and tested at great expense by a couple of companies? You know, we've got all sorts of things. We've got aerial platforms, balloons, you, you name it. Are, are these viable options or are they a little bit pie in the sky at the moment? Well, well maybe it's a two-part question. I, I asked the, I answered the first one first. I don't think it's a binary open RAN versus traditional. In fact, what we see for a long, long period of time is the traditional way of deploying a radio access network with, you know, the couple of key players providing the end-to-end -end connectivity, the radio head, and all the services will will be the mainstream business model for, for many years to come. And open RAN is a new, new player. Um, and within that, then you're going to have multiple variants of that. You're going to have uh, smaller players partnering with bigger players. Uh, you can have uh, it, it, either whether it be on the software level or the radio head um, is uh, and various commerce. And, and so, so that, that's that's going to be a, a long uh, time for, before we see it, what a new norm is, a new network is. Now, in terms of the the alternative aerial approaches, whether it be balloons or drones, I, I think it's super super interesting um, way of deploying a network in in places like. Um, uh, you know, disaster zones where, where you know, that there's a need for to set up a, a network instantly for a short period of time. I think applications like that are, are, are very viable. Uh, and then you, you, it's really a, a, a cost uh, operational um, uh, decision whether you buy infrastructure to put up a tower or you maintain a network of balloons or network of drones. So that that is very challenging. So so we we are very interested to see how that that um, evolves over over the coming years. Is that will that be a viable, sustainable network for these rural areas, or is it just more disaster recovery type of of uh, of use cases? So Mark, does does Red Hat have an interest in these alternate runs, or is it a case of you know just just seeing how some of these ideas might play out in the long term? 
Yeah, I think it's more the latter. Um, you know, talk to our RAN experts, the guys in the telco vertical. I think they're just a wait and see, right? They're not discounting any of these possibilities. But we're not taking a stance. We're not supporting one over the other. We're just waiting to see how it all, you know, how it all plays out. So, uh, Mark, if I can continue, um, as we look to, in a way, overhaul this, the, the legacy radio access network and the associated ecosystem, what are the missing pieces that we, as an industry, need to address and get right first? That's a that's an open question. I think. Um, we're looking at various alternatives in ways, obviously, to reduce costs and reduce, I would say, um, deployment you know, deployment costs of making it more efficient out in the marketplace. If we're going to go out to the unconnected areas of the world, simplicity needs to be key. And you know, and all the all the discussions I see between Intel and Red Hat and our partners, we're trying to simplify the deployment model. We're trying to simplify the amount of moving pieces, so to speak. We're virtualizing more. We're relying less on hardware slash copper fi or fiber cable and things like that, more wireless, et cetera. There's a lot of pieces that are in play. There are a lot of things that we're experimenting with Intel and others on. And we're going to look to move to the, the most optimal ways going forward. Daniel, what's the roadmap? What do we still need to do as an industry? Um, what's our next steps? I, in general, I think. Um, the leading players in, in the operator community need to make more of a stance. You know, there, there's clear leadership coming from the likes of Telefonica and Vodafone and others. I think they, there's more needs to be joined there. there, there they, it, it needs to be a, a village of voices there from the operator community to make a stance. Of, okay, well, well, we're going to nurture this, this uh, alternative supply chain and we're going to focus in on a couple of key markets. Um, it, to Mark's point, you, you know, it, it's a functionality and cost um, equation that they have to do at an R&D level. So, so you, you kind of need a bit of time for it to get the right functionality, reduce the cost, allocate uh, sites, and, and really encourage that ecosystem to be able to deploy, and then let them grow from there. And so that that's and that comes from leadership from the operators. And a key point here is Intel can't do it alone. Red Hat cannot do it alone. It is clearly about the ecosystem, and it's that puzzle of putting all the right pieces together, which could be five vendors, six vendors, seven vendors. You know, as we discussed in The Hague a few weeks ago at the SDN show, you know, Red Hat is working with partners like Intel to bring out solutions that are more apt to be deployed at the edge in these areas like virtual central office or things like distributed compute nodes through Red Hat OpenStack. But we're not doing it alone, right? We're doing it with Intel. We're doing it with a firm networks. We're doing it with HPE. We're doing it with a Altio Star, right? It's a, it's a, it's a true ecosystem play out there to bring the rest of the world connected and into 5G and RAN. Uh, w w one last uh, quick thing that we're seeing emerging in the network uh, or in the um, uh, the market is new IoT labs. You know, I think a great example of that here in Ireland is with Aspire Technologies. So Mavenir, Intel and others have worked with Aspire to create a, an IoT lab to allow the various different components come together, you know, socialize, you know, get the right interfaces, make sure it works and get that right in for a successful lab trial, get that successful for field trial. So I think the market is learning as we go and, and emerges of, of more IoT lab pockets worldwide, I think will greatly benefit the, the openness of the of the RAN and make it you know, go faster. So we've talked about um, the existing RAN, the legacy RAN, we've talked about the new RAN, not necessarily a, a binary choice, but a final question to the two of you, and Mark, if I can start with yourself. Um, this new RAN, this open virtualized RAN, should we expect it to become the norm at some point for, for RAN deployment models, or, or will it still be you know, a 50-50 type type choice. And if it does become the norm, when, when might we might see that happen? When might actual momentum and deployment start to take off? Well, I think deployments are in place now. Um, if you want to talk about market momentum and a majority of deployments being virtualized in the RAN space, you're probably talking three, four or five years, right? It's going to take some time for these deployments to move from where they are now to being fully virtualized. You know, much the same way that the you see in all these physical network functions turn into virtualized network functions, turn into containerized network functions. It's a journey, right? It's not going to happen overnight. Um, and there's going to be plenty of 
you know, physical and virtualized pieces uh, when containers hit the market also. It will take time. So there'll be traditional RAN while virtual RAN establishes a footprint and becomes the majority at some point, probably like I said, three, four, five years. Daniel, it's, it's, a, it's a journey. We're on the journey. At the start of the journey, will we see this, this new open RAN become the norm? Who knows? It, it, it's so far out in time. Um, when, we, when I've been working on virtual RAN now for, for a long time inside Intel, and we started with the, the, the premise that virtual RAN is equal to center RAN. Now we're in a situation where a, an open RAN can deliver a, a connectivity to ultra-rural networks. Uh, to due to enterprise, due to traditional macro base stations, due to centralized RAN, and everything in between. So the use case, that the target market for a um, cloud native virtual RAN it is much the, the the addressable TAM is much wider now. When that transition will happen, um, we don't know. As I said, I, I think there's a couple of lead players: Rakuten, Verizon, uh, Telefonica, Vo Vodafone. Those are, are, are signaling the, um, the. They're the market leaders for the, for for the rest of the the com service providers. If they're successful, I think there will be a lot more come along and adopt this approach. But even when they do, you need to go to a lab, to a FOA slash field trial, to early deployment. You need to train up your uh, your network engineers to, to to deploy things differently. It's more of an IT mindset than a telco mindset. There's so much things that need to be put in place. So it's certainly not overnight. Will it be five years? Will it be ten years? We we don't know. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll uh, meet again in a few years' time and, uh, and check on progress. But for now, Daniel and Mark, thank you both very much for joining us on Telecom TV. Thanks for having thank me. You.